I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, starting in verse 1. Exodus 17, starting in verse 1. Praise you, Lord. If you find it, say amen. Okay, so stand for the reading of the word. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, anoint this word. It's life. It's life. It's healing. Anoint it, God. Attach your spirit to it, bore it into our hearts, let it bring forth fruit in Jesus' name. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. And therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And so Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and also take with your, in your hand your rod with which you struck the river, and go before Behold, I will stand before you, and there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come from it, and the people that the people might drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the Lord. So he called the name of the place Massa or Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, "He the, is the Lord among us or not?" May God add His blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. You see, the thing about it is this. I think there's a big misconception in the church that when you get saved, you ain't never going to have any problems. You're not ever going to have any more struggles. I, I want to tell you something. People don't want to read the bumper sticker on your car until they know you have overcome something. They don't care that you wear those T-shirts around. they got all those catchy Christian sayings on them. That ain't being a witness. You know what being a witness is? A witness is being delivered from meth addiction. Can I get a witness out of somebody? A witness is being delivered from cancer. A witness is being going through a divorce and surviving it and have God put your whole life back together. That's what being a witness is. They don't care what you say till they see what you've been through. You want to be a witness? You better get ready for the wilderness trials because wilderness trials are training ground of a true disciple. And you're going to go through some things and God's going to bring you through them to equip you. James 1, 2, and 4. Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but patience, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete and lack nothing. The three-legged stool of discipleship is encounters with the Holy Ghost. You need those. The second thing is uh, an intentional, devoted course of study, studying the Word of God and studying His kingdom. And the third thing is life. L-I-F-E. Oh, it's full of traps. One minute you you with the family at Christmas time. You've had a big Christmas, a big holiday. Next thing you know, you're in a seizure and you're in a helicopter and you come to. I got a friend of mine had a heart attack here in Hereford, and they put him in a helicopter here at the hospital and they medevaced him to Amarillo. And they started treating him. I went and prayed with him there. He got better. Before they discharged him, the doctor came to him, and he said. Now, sir, you need to quit smoking. And he said, we have a video we'll show you on how to quit smoking. And J.W. said, uh, Doc, have you ever seen Hereford, Texas out of the back end of one of them helicopters? He said, no. He said, I don't need no video. <laughs> I can quit smoking on my own, I guarantee you. And he did. My point is, if you haven't ever been through nothing, if you haven't been delivered from something, if you haven't been through an experience where, where, where the boy had a seizure that was so bad, the hospital in Clovis said, we got to air flight him to Lubbock. You know, it was not a minor thing. 
But now his testimony is, is I was scared. I was, I was concerned. I was anxious. But the prayer of faith, anoint the sick, and the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. And now the doctor goes, I don't know what's wrong with him. I want to give this doctor some credit. You know what most of them do? They make up things. Even though they don't know, they got to look good because they're going to turn it in on Medicare. Hallelujah. At least this doctor had courage enough to say, I don't have a clue. I can't find anything wrong with him. This is the power of witness. I had a preacher that had a real impact on me when I was pretty new in the faith. His name was John Randall. And he, he came to the Nazarene church and Man, this guy was the most incredible teacher I'd ever been around. He was powerful, and, and he had a real, real impact on me. He was the team chaplain for the Texas Tech football team, and he could tell sports stories and stuff and make it biblical, you know, use biblical analogies, and just one of the great teachers maybe ever. I would say of all the teachers of the Word of God that I've ever heard, including on the Internet, in person, or wherever, he's in the top ten. He wanted me to go to Lithuania with him. He said, you know, I'm going over there on a trip. And he said, we're going to take Bibles in there. He said, you know, our people get arrested all the time. And God delivers them. And, you know, and said, we had a guy who had, they had a gun held to his head. And, and, you know, he had Bibles in his, you know, deal and all. And he prayed. And, you know, God. And, they go, and he goes, it's awesome. It's awesome. And he could teach that in a way you would really think, man, that was really awesome. I'd love to go through that. But I didn't go, and that's one of my real regrets because he was such a great man of God. But I, as I, the Lord gave me this revelation out of Exodus 17, and I, I'm in my study, and God says, I just something in me just wanted to track him down. I haven't heard from him in years, probably five or six years. And so I just got on the Internet, and I entered his, Googled his name and put the wrong spelling in and had to get the right guy. And, and it pulls up a sermon, and he's in East Texas preaching in a church, and a year ago, and he's talking about this very same thing. He said, the world don't care what you say because you're a bunch of sissies. Man, you've got to be pretty, pretty, pretty confident in your ministry to stand up and preach a word like that. Amen? He said, you murmur and you complain, and they don't care, what you're, they don't care about your, 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 your evidence of witness until they see you overcome something, and then they want to hear what you have to say. And I was just fascinated by that. And then I looked for another sermon and I found another one. This was Christmas of this year and it was in his own church in Lubbock, Texas. And he starts out by talking about how well the chemo is going. Now remember, there's a year between these two sermons. And then he starts talking about how when you have pancreatic cancer, you got less than a 3-4% survival rate. So the brother contracted pancreatic cancer between the time he stood before the church and said, you're a bunch of sissies because you ain't ever overcome nothing and they don't want to hear what you say until you begin to show them what it is to overcome. He went in a year from that to developing pancreatic cancer and being on chemotherapy. He said, I've lost 60 pounds. I don't recommend this as a way to lose weight. And I'm going... First, I was grieved for my friend. I began to pray for him right then. And then he said, look, here's the deal. God can take me home. And I've heard him say this publicly lots of times. God can take me home now, or he can leave me here. But wherever I am, I'm going to live a tail-kicking life for Jesus. I'm going to be a witness I'm going to be a witness in my ministry. I'm going to be a witness in the football field. I'm going to be a witness on my deathbed. I'm going to testify to the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. I've heard him say that over and over and over and over again. And he said in this sermon, he said, now I don't have any idea why I'm one of the 4%. I don't know why my chemotherapy has responded and they said it had less than a 4% chance of working. I don't know why I've still got 70% of my liver left and all I need is 20 and, and they say that I'm cured. I don't know why, but I will tell you this, God can take me home or he can leave me here, but if he leaves me here, I'm going to continue to do the work. And he talked about how while he was doing chemotherapy, he began to put together a chemotherapy ministry. Come on, somebody. The people coming in wheelchairs in his church, they're coming in line in the perimeter of his church. The guys that were in there with him, watching him go through what they were going through, and him praising Jesus the whole time. They wanted that inner strength that he had. They wanted that positive outlook when they're saying, ain't no way you can survive this. I don't care. I don't care because of my circumstance don't define who I am. My circumstance don't define me. 
Maybe you lost a lot of money and you're broke and you ain't got none now. That don't mean you're poor. That's what the word says. It says that you are rich in spirit. Can I get a witness out of somebody? You got to quit letting your circumstance define who you are. You got to rise above that. <clears throat> I may be divorced, but I ain't a loser. I may be broke, but I ain't poor. I might be sick, but I'm telling you, I'm as alive as I have ever been in my life. Come on, somebody. Because I have the Spirit of God in me. When you get there, when you get there, when you get where you're like Brian, <clears throat> and God has delivered me from so many things, I'm going to have to go on tour to talk about it. I got so many, I could, Brian could write a book. He really could write a book, and I think he ought to. What is it? Is it a book about how he never had any tests or he never had any struggles? or he ne No, it's a book about facing mountains in the name of Jesus. Amen. See, the thing about it is, is, is that we in the church have taught, and the faith people are particularly bad about that, and I'm one of the faith people, so I can talk about them. I am one. But we've, we have a tendency to say, well, if you're struggling, your faith must be weak. If you're broke, then you must not have no faith. If you're sick, you must not have no faith. If you're addicted, then you must not have no faith. Let me tell you something. If you're in a struggle, hallelujah, you're about to get through that struggle with Jesus and you're about to be qualified as a real witness for the power of the gospel in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a praise in here. That's what I'm talking about. But you can't let your circumstance define you. Randall's talked about the difference between a priest and a prophet. He said, a priest is just someone that preaches to you all the time. Galatians 6.17 said that Paul was more than a priest. He was a prophet because it says that he bore the marks. He said, from now on, let nobody trouble me, for I bear on my body the marks of the Lord Christ. One of Jesus' commandments were, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. Rejoice, he said. And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so did they, the prophets who came before you. Let me tell you, when your word, when your preaching is no longer preaching and it becomes prophetic, is when you've got some scars on you. Come on, somebody. When you've been through some stuff. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Shirley? When you've been through some stuff and you survived it and you came through it and you got the marks, they know you've been through it. Oh, they know you've been through it. But you ain't let it define you. You haven't let it become. You have not become your circumstance. You have overcome your circumstance. That's when you become a witness. And I think I see a lot of people sometimes, and they get in such a chronic circumstance that it begins to become their identity, and it's a struggle. You can't do that. You cannot become what you're dealing with. You have to be who Christ said that you are. And one of the things that helps you, one of the things that helps you understand it is, is learning to rely on Moses' rod. Let me tell you, this is, the, this is the revelation out of Exodus chapter 17. They were in a circumstance, and they were wondering where God is. And God said, take the rod and strike the rock. See, some of you need to take the rod that's the authority. The rod types the authority of God. You need to take the authority of God and strike your circumstance with it. Amen? He said, take the rod and strike the rock, and the water came out. The rod is the authority of God. Let me tell you something. I'm going through something. If it's not God's will, what I do is I take a stand on the word of God, the authority of God, and I come against it and begin to fight a spiritual campaign against it. And then I begin to see change and breakthrough in the natural. And when it comes to the subject of authority, you need to understand that Jesus is the ultimate authority. In the Old Testament, it was the rod of Moses. But in Philippians 2, 8 and 10, it says... <clears throat> Jesus, being found in appearance, a man humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him, had given him the name which is above every name. That is the authority which is above every authority. That the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. This is the thing you need to understand. When Jesus came to the earth, he was just a third member of the Trinity. Yeah, he was God. But he didn't have authority over the earth. The devil had authority over the earth. But when he went to the cross, he won that authority and became the name above every name. What name is he above? His name is above Caesar's. 
His name is above cancer. His name is above divorce. His name is above bankruptcy. His name is above everything that you're facing, every mountain that you're looking at. Every mountain you're looking at, his name is above that. And if you'll take the rod and strike the rock, if you'll begin to speak to the rock, this is another thing. When they came back to to go through this situation again, they made two passes at Meribah. The first one, they struck the rock with the rod. Years later, they came back by again. Same situation, no water, no provision. And God says, this time I want you to speak to the rock. Now, the difference is the rock this time is not referred to by the original word in Hebrew, which is sore, which means a boulder. The second time the Lord says, I want you, Moses, to go and speak to the rock, the name here used is Shelah. It, it, it means a lofty, craggy fortress. The rock that had been lifted up, the rock that had already been struck, now became the one that was in authority. Jesus was the rock, the cornerstone of our faith. He came here and he was struck. He was struck, but yet he was resurrected. And when he became resurrected, he became the name above every name. And you got to speak to the rock. What you do now is you speak what Jesus said. You speak in his name. You speak in his authority. And whatever situation you're in, and you're going to be in some. They're going to be difficult situations. Evoke the authority of the name of Jesus and say, in Jesus' name, this is not consistent with his will. It's not God's will that Brian be sick. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. I have news for you. It's not God's will that you be sick either. It's not God's will that you be broke. It's not God's will that you struggle with the things you struggle with. But it ain't going to change until you learn to fight the fight God's way by striking and speaking to the rock, the authority of the word of God. You've got to begin to speak what God's saying. If you believe that, say amen. amen. They tempted the Lord... But this is the part, this is the revelation. I don't know what went through John Randall's mind when he went around talking about sissy Christians and a bunch of whiners and a lot of other doctors said, you got pancreatic cancer. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what went through his mind. But I have a pretty good guess. Where are you, God? Where are you, God? I've been gone over the world, been serving you. I've been smuggling Bibles into Lithuania. I've been risking my life for your gospel. I've been, I, I know him well enough to know that that was just a fleeting thing, that that didn't stay very long. But I bet you that I entered, the devil offered him that thought. Where are you, God? And this is what it says in Exodus 17, 7. He called the name of this place Meribah because of the contention. Meribah means to contend. Because of the contention with the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord saying, the Lord is not among us. See, this is the thing what happens. You get in the circumstance and the first thing you say is, where are you, God? And doubt tests the Lord more than anything. Don't you know that if they had been there in this place in the desert and they were dying with thirst and their livestock was about to die, if someone had said, if, the, if God's watching from heaven and the angels are up there with him and they're all leaning over the balcony and they're watching the children of Israel, if one of the children of Israel, other than Moses, other than Aaron, had said, all we've got to do is take the rod, which is the authority of God, and strike that rock and water will come out of it. Don't you know God would have said, that's my kids, man. It was my, that's my boy. But instead, the first thing they said is, God has forsaken us. And it angered God. One of the reasons he told Moses to strike the rock is because God was angry. He delivered them. Levi, have you forgotten what you've been delivered from, man? you got a testimony just like his. God parted the Red Sea and brought you through, and he drowned your enemies while you watched, didn't he? But what happens when you get in a circumstance is the first thing you do is you go, God has forsaken me. Are you kidding me? That's what God said. Do they not get it? Do they not understand what I have done for them? What makes them think that I have left them? What made them think God had left them is they were in a circumstance to start with. The problem is you're always going to have a circumstance because you're living life with all its ups and downs. The trick is to make God's will bring to bear on your circumstance. Amen? Jesus said, blessed is he who overcomes. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 said, it's by faith. It's by grace through faith. By grace through faith. I want you to say this. By grace grace. through faith. faith. By grace grace. through faith. faith. 
How are you going to get healed? By grace, through faith. How are you going to get your finances restored? By grace, through faith. How are you going to get delivered from addiction? By grace, through faith. This section over here understands it. It's the only way you're going to ever become an overcomer is to learn. So this is what Jesus said. He said in Revelation 21, 6 and 8, he said, uh, Jesus said, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the fountain. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. You want to know the truth, folks? I've taught this before. But some of you weren't here, so I'm going to say it again. In the area you overcome is the area where your authority is. When I teach on finances, it fills the place up. You know why? I've earned an anointing to teach on finances because I've been so broke, I've been lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut. I've had my utilities turned off. I've gone from, I've gone from, a, from, from, a, from a star in the business world to somebody that they wouldn't touch for like a leper because I've been completely busted, completely. And God picked me up from that mess. And he put my life back together. And he taught me how his financial system worked. He taught me the dangers of trusting in the world system. And I have earned the right to speak prophetically into your finances because of the area that I have overcome, I've been given anointing to teach in. You know what? You got an area. Don't tell me you don't. You have an area. You got an area. Some of it's healing in your body. Lots of people are going to get healed through y'all's ministry. Lots. The area that you overcome is the area that you have, you shall inherit all things in. Amen? And I'll be his God, and I, he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. He who overcomes his circumstances and becomes totally reliant on grace understands grace. Understands grace. Grace is more than forgiveness. Grace is a non-physical power that emanates from beyond us, which is available to us to do innocent for us, what we can't do on our own. When you get to where you can't do it, you're in a good place because you've got to totally rely on grace. When you talk to an addict, they will tell you, just say no, don't quit, don't work. You're in a place where you can't do it. And when you rely on grace, it'll bring you through. And the he who overcomes will be someone who understands how grace works. Brother John Randalls understands the healing power of grace. It's an interesting thing about him. I'm just going to share this with you. He was the first guy that taught me that there are two dispensations of grace in a believer's life. There's the Red Sea and there's the Jordan River. One is salvation, the other is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And at the time, he was a Baptist teacher at Southwest Seminary. You've got to love a guy like that. He ain't scared of the religious hierarchy. He's going to teach the truth. And the truth he would tell you if he's standing here right before you right today is, is you can't live without God's grace. You can't live unless you learn how to trust in God's grace. Huh, Mr. Jenkins? You have to learn. You got to learn. And you'll become an overcomer then. God gave me this word for this church. So I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. Say, I'm living on grace. Praise you, Lord. See, Brian's testimony is what it is to live on grace. The doctors didn't fix him because they never could figure out what was wrong with him. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Twenty nine ten. Now I'm gonna lose some of you here, so you're just gonna have to be patient with me. But those of you that have been in this church for a while, you know what the smeat of judgments are. Twenty nine ten says, For thus says the Lord, after seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. Now what Jesus is saying, or what the Lord is saying to his people in this time in history is the Smita judgments are about to expire. I know some of you don't know what that is. I can't help that. You'll have to get the videos and go back and read them. But America, as you know, has come under the Smita judgments. Now this is the thing that you have. This is the word for you, church. This is the word for you. You're immune from the Smita judgments. 
You're living in Goshen. You're living in an area we were just talking about. Sister Lonnie went to Zion. How many of you went to Zion in Trinity? Sister Lonnie went to Zion saw, and saw Jonathan Kahn himself. And I'm sure he addressed the Smeet to Judgments. The point I'm trying to make is, is that this is what the Lord has for you. You're already immune from these Smeet to Judgments that are coming on the earth, coming on America. And I know the thoughts that I think toward you, church, says the Lord. Thoughts for peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and you'll go and you'll pray to me and I'll listen to you. Listen, you're not, you're not praying. You've got to keep praying because God's listening to you, especially, especially to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search with me with all your heart. I will let you find me. This is what God is trying to say to you as a church. I don't care what circumstances are going on around you. God is saying that when you call on him, when you pray, and listen, there's two th elements here, calling on God and praying. They're two different things. It's one thing to pray, but it's quite another to get on your face before God and cry out and say, God, I need your intervention in my circumstance. Carol and I have given our testimony here before. There was a time when the devil had attacked our marriage and it was in bad shape. It was in bad shape. This was after I was in ministry. And I didn't know whether my marriage was going to survive. So you ain't supposed to talk like that if you're a minister. The problem is the other minister's marriages are in bad shape too. They're just lying to you and telling you everything's okay. Let me tell you what. You know how you set the devil free? Turn the light of truth on right. That's how you drive the devil out. Turn the light of truth on and he has to leave. And we were going through an extremely difficult time and we came up here in the middle of the night. We came up here and laid before this altar, both of us. And we said, God, if we're going to survive, you have to fix us. Because I've read all of your books on marriage. I know, I got, none of it works. If you don't have the grace of God. But those that learn to rely on grace become overcomers. And God healed our marriage. And he restored it. And we learned some important lessons through that whole process of how the enemy works. Let me tell you what, if you're in ministry, you two need to hear this. If you're in ministry, I promise you the first thing the devil will attack is your marriage. You have to keep that girded up. You have to keep that strong. Don't take anything for granted. But when we got to the point where we could come to the altar and be honest with God and say, you know what, God, we've tried everything and it ain't working. If it's going to work, you got to make it work. And you know what he did? He began to heal us. This is what the Lord said. When you seek me, I'll let you find me. As long as you're still doing your own deal, well, good luck with that. Let me know how that goes for you. But when you get broken, huh, Brad? When you get broken and you say, I can't kick this, I can't beat this, God, you're either going to have to kill me and take me home or heal me, one of the two. I can't go another day like this. That's when that grace begins to flow in your life. That's when you become an overcomer, amen? That's when you begin to get a witness, huh, Brad? You know what it's like to be in a, in a, in a, in a comatose state, don't you? I remember the time when we come prayed for you. Brad didn't do all the drugs. He just did 90% of them, hallelujah, amen? I know there's been a few that he missed that he couldn't get to. And when he got saved radically, God began to change his life and he went into a, and he went into a coma because of his like sudden, you know, when you, when you quit using drugs, sometimes it has that effect on you. And he went into this coma and they had him in the hospital and he was in a comatose host state in ICU. I went in there and I prayed for him and he couldn't hear a thing that I was saying. He was in a coma. And the machines were going dink, 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 the little chart thing, you know, and all of this stuff. And the nurses were coming in there every five minutes. Don't stay in there too long. Don't be, la, la, la. And I said, we're going to pray for him. And we anointed him with oil and we began to pray God's word over him and tears began to come and run down. Well, we're praying for him. As a matter of fact, I was praying in tongues. If I remember right, I was praying in the Holy Ghost. And tears began to come out of the corners of his eyes and drip down his cheeks while he was in a coma. He may have been in a physical coma, but he was not in a spiritual coma. Can I get a witness out of somebody? And he was about to show the devil that he was going to beat him till he was black and blue. 
because he was going to let God change his life and let God set him free and deliver him. And he's still clean to this day. You're still clean, aren't you, Brad? Oh, just check it. Okay. <laughs> I know he's still clean. It don't, Brad has got a right. I mean, look at him. Does he look like a preacher to you? He'll have more impact for the gospel than 10 of the greatest preachers that ever preached. Because he's overcome something. While the whole world watched and the devil tried to kill him, he survived. People want to see what's on his t-shirt. They want to read it. Come on, somebody. We're going to take communion here in a minute. Not. I'm just telling you, this is stirred in me deep. I'm going to tell you, you are a bunch of folks that are great witnesses for the power of God to overcome. And I believe we're entering into a season. God is saying, you understand this. You're going to call on me. You're going to pray to me. And you're going to call on me. And, you're going to, and I'm going to be found by you. I'm going to be attentive to your prayers. You know why? Because you ain't trying to pretend like you're something you're not. You're witnesses to the power of the resurrection. Now, some of you have lived great lives and you never had any sin in your life, and I don't want you to feel excluded from this club. Amen? That's good. That's awesome. Some of you have lived sinless lives, but you prayed for your children while they were off chasing after the devil for years and years and years. And your testimony is, God is faithful. Isn't it? I don't care what you're going through. A rebellious kid... Lung tissue that's dying, scarring. I don't care what it is. His name is above every name. And what he's waiting for us to do is to pray and call on him. And he'll hear and he'll respond. Amen.